Hey, good morning and welcome to the 2019 Ancient Theatre Festival uh, here um, at the University of Warwick, organized by the Department of Classics and Ancient History. My name is Emanuela Bacola. Uh, I'm an associate professor in Ancient Greek Language and Literature, and I generally oversee the festival every year. And we are delighted to be in the position to once again, to host so many schools from so many parts of the country, although this time we have <laughs> a few absences, hopefully they will come, um, um, for, a, for a project that um, we're so proud of, especially as it has resulted from the hard work of our students and their imaginative collaboration with their lecturers and over several months. So thank you for coming, and we hope that you find the day entertaining, uh, intellectually stimulating, and inspiring. This ancient Greek, uh, ancient th theater festival for schools, it's gradually becoming one of the most important events of the departmental calendar. And as you can probably see from your surroundings, and as you will see from our beautiful set, um, uh, it is increasingly ambitious, both materially and intellectually. Now, for the fulfillment of our material ambition, um, we are grateful to the Warwick Academic Resourcing Committee, the Warwick Impact Fund, the Widening Participation Fund, and the IAS uh, Warwick Impact Development Fund, without the financial support of which this would have never been possible. For the intellectual aspect, now we only find it natural that the drama festival and the student production have evolved into this uh, ambitious project that it is. The Department of Classics and Ancient History provides the students with ample opportunities to explore every aspect of the ancient world, from its material culture, to its history, to its political institutions, its society, its arts. All these aspects of the classical world are hugely important for our understanding um, of a phenomenon so multidimensional and so multifaceted as the theater of the Greek world. Hello. Uh, if you want to find out more about the process of putting this production together and the opportunities that it has offered the students to develop creative skills, please have a look at our production program that the students so lovingly put together and also our dedicated website. Um, everything also that you will see today will be video recorded and uploaded on our website um, within uh, a couple of weeks. Um, please also, please, please, spare two minutes um, at some point during the festival to fill in the audience feedback uh, form, answering that one question, that, uh, the uh, feedback form that you will find in uh, your programs. Um, you can answer this question either before or after the production. Just spare these two minutes, please. These feedback forms are incredibly important for us to maintain our funding, okay, which makes everything possible, and to make this day possible for free as well, for all of you. And this is the only thing that we are asking from you in return. Also, if you are considering Warwick as a place for study, there are details for our next open days uh, in the back cover, including a day in London in a few days. Um, uh, and now, uh, and actually, before I pass uh, over to Michael Scott, who will introduce you to Aristophanic comedy and its historical context, let me say a few words ab about uh, theater and festivals in the Greek world to put you in, um, in a context. Um, so um, a very important thing for uh, everyone to, um, to understand theater in uh, the ancient world is that theater is not an exceptional you know, um, uh, case as far as performance is con uh, concerned. On the contrary, uh, Greek culture is overwhelmingly, or was overwhelmingly, a performance culture. And this means that performance, so public display, um, sharing you know, with the community, um, was at the heart of every aspect of, uh, of uh, Greek life. Um, in Athens, but also increasingly all over the Greek world. So, um, and here I'm not only referring to the multiple festivals 
that um, uh, Greek uh, uh, polis, Greek cities, had all year round, okay, both uh, attracting local audiences and also audiences from all around the world, all around the Greek world, panhel um, panhellenic audiences, um, which featured music and dance performances, instrumental performances, rhapsodic recitations, um, all sorts of poetry, and always in a competitive context, so always for a prize. Um, a bit like, um, you know, you see, um, um, I don't know, comedy, stand-up comedy, or even cooking in, in, in British, um, you know, in British uh, media. Everything is shown in a competitive context. So competition, competition is incredibly important in these festivals. But also, uh, and when I say performance, I don't only mean art, but um, philosophy also um, was disseminated a lot of the times in performance. Um, cosmology in performance. Public as uh, political assemblies also um, uh, featured performances of rhetoric. Uh, public speech was incredibly important and performance skills um, guaranteed um, effectiveness of these politicians. Even religion, something that we consider so esoteric today, um, had a strong performative uh, aspect, since um, ritual and cult uh, in the Greek world uh, was uh, performative with processions, uh, participation from, um, the, um, from the believers, from the, the participants, and also uh, spectacle. Uh, so this is the context where you need to situate the theater of Athens in uh, the ancient world. So uh, Greek theater is part and also product, okay, so inheritor of all this you know, encompassing song and performance culture and performance, as you've seen, meant you know, very broadly. And as an experience, uh, Ancient theater, Greek theater, was very different from today's experience of going to the theater. We've already seen the religious you know, aspect of, of, um, the, of, of performances, and we will see how festivals uh, incorporated um, religious performances. Um, but let me start from the very basics. Okay, So today, going to the theater, um, the space of going to the theater, it looks something like this. No? In, in Greece, uh, in ancient Greece, it couldn't have been more different than this, okay? As opposed to uh, this uh, uh, indoor, artificially um, lit, um, enclosed space that um, you know, was, oh, is open to the public mainly in the evenings and has you know, a few selective, uh, usually, I mean, a few selective audiences. Um, although the arts I find in, in Britain are, are very extremely, are, are very inclusive, but um, generally, you know, theater for us is, is uh, something that few people, few people do. Um, as opposed to that, and as, as this uh, uh, photo of a theater of the fifth century suggests to you, going to the theater in the Greek world was, you know, going to an outdoor space um, in the middle of the day, um, as part of a festival that uh, um, attracted thousands of people, um, eight to 10,000 in uh, the fifth century, more later on. Um, uh, during the day in the outdoor with, you know, um, the natural elements on top of you, natural lighting, um, and also as part of a wider festival. Uh, also, the numbers suggest that it, is, it was a, uh, a, a process that attracted not only the selected few, but in fact was supposed to be an event that um, was addressed to the whole uh, city. Um, uh, so, what were these festivals? So, now, you hear some uh, images um, from uh, modern Greece, uh, from modern Greek festivals. Uh, just to give you a feeling of what these festivals, you know, would have, you would have, might have looked like, um, with um, the massive participation and also the fact that they included um, 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 something like a carnival celebration, also a, a, a huge barbecue for the whole city, um, and um, dances. 
so this is mainly for the, um, these evocative, I hope you don't think that this is um, accurate, uh, these evocative images um, mainly refer to the Great Dionysia, so the main festival where uh, Greek theater, well, Athenian theater took place, um, which was a festival that lasted six days. Uh, it included at least one or two days of religious processions with sacrifices of hundreds of animals, um, where the city invested, a hu uh, in invested huge amounts of time and money. And of course, um, that was because um, if you count the number of people who were performing in these festivals, there were over 1,200 um, people, 1,200 individuals having specific roles in these uh, festivals, um, including um, in um, uh, roles in competitions between large choruses, competitions between tragedies, uh, satire dramas, and comedies. And this festival also was um, um, largely, I mean, what we would say today international, it was uh, uh, taking place in spring when sailing was allowed, was, uh, was possible, sorry, in the ancient, <laughs> it was possible in the ancient world. Uh, so um, not only Athenian audiences um, uh, at attended, but also audiences from all around the Greek world. Um, a smaller, a lesser, um, smaller event, the Lenaia, about which Michael Scott will talk to you later, um, similar but uh, smaller event, um, uh, the La Elenaia in winter, where uh, tragedy had a less uh, important role and comedy mostly dominated. Now, uh, there is a misconception that uh, Greek uh, dramas were pr uh, performed only once, uh, and then, I don't know, like, you know, just then condemned to, I don't know, a, a drawer, an ancient drawer, but no, not at all. Reperformances were a major part of the afterlife of Greek tragedies and comedies. And a huge role in that had the um, Dionysia, the smaller festival in the townships around Attica uh, to play. Um, so we know at least four illustrious festivals around, those, um, yeah, around the, the townships. Of, uh, of Attica were a um, place where basically touring and uh, audiences that were very much very big fans of the theater, you know, were going from, uh, uh, from township to township attending, you know, those festivals. Um, and finally, already in the fifth century, theater was exported abroad. Okay? We know that in the 470s, Aeschylus' play, the Persians, uh, was produced in, the Syrac in Syracuse after it was produced in Athens. Um, so, um, um, in short, uh, theater, not only an Athenian phenomenon, but um, a, uh, a phenomenon that you know, was to be found in other places of the Greek world um, and shared very often and became very soon a you know, pan-Hellenic um, a, a a pan, um, an, an event that had a pan-Hellenic fame. Um, uh, some spaces, just uh, because I don't want people to think, this is uh, uh, the, how the modern theater of Syracuse, in, the, the theater of Syracuse in Sicily has survived. Um, and we believe that it was stone theater already in the fifth century, but um, as well as this theater of Thoricos, in the south uh, east of uh, Attica, um, but other theaters were, you know, less um, uh, less uh, uh, um, uh, grand, less uh, already, you know, in um, so in the fifth century. And as you will see, also the theater of Dionysus uh, was the um, same. Um, so the development of of theater in Athens. Um, so I've been talking about the festivals and um, I've been referring to Athens. Athens is, of course, the cultural capital of uh, Greece um, already from the 6th century, especially uh, in, in the 5th century. Um, and the uh, uh, Athenian theater, um, but as, as we said, it was exported in many ways around the Greek world. Now, Athenian theater uh, was conventionally thought to have been born, like became a, um, a thing, uh, in uh, 534, so in the 6th century. Um, 
and at, in a period where democracy had not yet been born, or had not yet been, uh, become an institution in, in Athens. And in fact, um, the constitution that Athens uh, had in that period was tyranny. And the tyrants made huge investments in those festivals, um, uh, which were very much appealing to the people. However, um, Athenian theater, and as we know it today, and from the plays that have survived uh, today, um, is intrinsically connected with uh, democracy. Uh, we have plays only that um, have, uh, that were composed and produced uh, during the uh, radical, actually, period of uh, democracy. Democracy was uh, instituted in Athens in 508 BC and um, was um, acquired its radical you know, form around 460 uh, BC. Um, uh, apart from democracy, apart from a democratic uh, medium, um, um, the Athenian, um, Athenian theater uh, also, apart, no, sorry, um, apart from the baggage of democracy, uh, uh, the theater also carries um, the baggage uh, of the recent history of uh, Athens, um, especially the Persian Wars, um, which um, lasted for about 10 years, finished around 479 BC. Uh, after that, Athens, already a democracy, uh, developed into an empire. Its prosperity boomed. Um, uh, issues about uh, imp um, imperialism, issues about how you treat your subjects, issues about how you treat uh, the money that your subjects give you uh, became prominent and they all feature in uh, many of the plays that have survived. Um, uh, other things that are important, so we said democracy, we said you know, the recent historical um, uh, events of the Persian Wars, uh, Greek uh, Athenian theater inherited also a large um, and rich heritage, a rich philosophical tradition, uh, what we call um, the, the pre-Socratic uh, pre tradition, a cosmology, natural philosophy, and also developed uh, during um, a, um, a fairly um, um, revolutionary you know, intellectual, um, in, uh, intellectual process that we um, uh, resembled like, resembled the Enlightenment in the middle of the fifth century. Um, the movement, what we say of the sophists, um, with uh, which um, I explored um, religious, traditional religious, philosophical, political, and social ideas. Um, I mean, Athenian culture has always been doing that, but in the middle of the fifth century, um, it seems to uh, have been even more prominent. So, under all of these, uh, uh, during all of these developments, um, parallel to all of these developments, we had the development of Athenian theater to uh, what it is um, as we know it from the surviving place today. Um, now. Some, um, our earliest play is the, uh, that has survived, although theater, as we said, was instituted around 534, is the Persians um, of Aeschylus, a, a tragedian that will feature in The Frogs, uh, or his comic counterpart anyway. Uh, the latest uh, tragedy, sorry, I think this was, uh, so the latest tragedy comes from the end of the fifth century, latest comedy, it uh, comes from much, much later, um, um, as a, when a tragedy stopped being uh, composed in original form, but comedy continued up to the end of the middle, um, yeah, up to the end of the fourth century and even in the third century. Now, what does this mean? So we have over 150 years um, um, worth of, of productions. Um, we estimate that around 1,200 plays were composed and produced um, from the beginning of uh, the, uh, the dramatic festivals to the end of the fifth century. 
BC. Now, out of these, sadly, only 43 have survived. Um, and um, out of 100 playwrights that we estimate that, or we know that we're writing uh, and producing in the fifth century, only four have survived, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes. So as you can imagine, we have a 2% really of what was uh, produced at the time, and we need to keep this in mind when we make generalizations about, um, about the uh, Greek tragedy and Greek comedy. Um, finally, um, I want to uh, finish with a reference to the spaces of, uh, of Greek theater. I said before that not all theaters were made of stone, despite our images uh, of them, um, you know, uh, today. Uh, so the Greek theater, the, uh, theater of, uh, of Dionysus in the fifth century, in fact, um, uh, did not have a, um, an auditorium made of stone, uh, but uh, it was mostly a, a temporary construction that uh, contractors were hired by the city um, to come and, and um, install, so the auditorium and the uh, Skene building. Um, imagine that this was what the theater probably uh, looked like in the fifth century, so at the very height of uh, Athenian theater. Uh, fame. Um, so um, a space looked, uh, would have looked a bit like this from the point of view of the audience with a very large uh, Skene building um, and a very significant uh, you know, door, one probably in the fifth century. Um, so uh, and then um, what you would expect to see in an original performance of uh, Greek theater uh, and specifically for Greek comedy, would have been three to four actors who were professionals, um, a 24 member chorus, uh, who were a hugely important part of the performance. Um, they were all citizens, uh, they were not professionals, um, and it is an, a, an extremely distinct part of. Uh, a Greek performance culture. You would have seen singing and dancing by the chorus. You could have uh, had not only recitation, but also singing by the characters, as well as musical accompaniment. And lately also we think, um, you know, sound effects as, as well. Um, as well as some theater machinery also, like a crane um, or, you know, a trolley you know, uh, uh, some of these things you will see in, uh, in our, uh, um, some, some elements of spectacle you will see today in our performance. As scenery was minimal, so don't think of, you know, uh, naturalistic scenery uh, that we're used to from um, modern theater. Um, the rich spaces of Greek theater, especially of comedy that changes spaces a lot of the time, are constructed through uh, uh, words for the mind. Uh, so this, is, this was my um, introduction to Greek theater, and now I want to pass over to uh, Professor Michael Scott, who will talk to you about the historical context of uh, Athenian comedy. Thank you very much.